Ja. Hallo, dit is Fritz van Spanje, in de Mediterranean Sea, zoals je zei. Ja. Dank je voor je talk. Ik appreciate het heel erg. And my question is, uh, is the mother um, a kind of vibration which includes uh, energy force, uh, unlimited love, compassion, and joy? Can we understand mother as a, as a complex vibration like that I told you? And even more? Thank you. Okay. So is the mother a complex uh, energy force? Let me put it like that, a divine energy and force because to make it um, more complete. By divine is meant the highest, the most perfect, the most beautiful. Well, she is but not just that. All things in this creation are form and the formless. So too with the divine. There is the formless essence of the divine and the mother is certainly that divine energy. She is the Shakti of the divine. So in that sense, she is the supreme force. But all things in manifestation take a form. So if we want to go out of this creation, we can look upon mother just as a supreme Shakti. That's how the Tantric Siddhas worship her. They go step by step through the ten different forms of the divine mother. Starting with Shailabala to Siddhidatri. And then she projects them into the formless. You know that story of Ramakrishna and Totapuri. Where he finally says that you have to slay even the form of Kali whom you worship. With the sword of discernment. So you can be liberated into the utter infinite. Yes, if the goal is liberation, form becomes a means to arrive at the formless. But here, because the whole purpose is manifestation through form. In fact, all manifestation, even the gods have a form. All manifestation is about the form. So, she is not just the divine Shakti disembodied, but the embodiment of the divine Shakti. And that makes a world of difference. Meaning thereby, she is working out in and through her own form, the possibilities of, uh, you know, the human form being uplifted to the greatest heights. What is worked out in her form can work out within us if we open to her. So, We have to look upon her not just as a you know, uh, divine Shakti, which she is of course, but an embodied divine Shakti, which is what is meant by the avatar. Second aspect is that even the divine Shakti, which is beyond, is it just a force or a conscious force? Because it makes again a difference. When we use the word she is a force, now force we are used to, nature is a force, everything is a force in this creation. So when we reduce things to force and vibrations, it's, it's one way of looking at it definitely in a valid way, science approaches like that. But what is that supreme force and supreme vibration? Is it not conscious of itself? Because it's supreme consciousness. That's how the world becomes conscious because of a ray of that consciousness. So a force which is conscious of itself is by its very nature a being. You see, they, there is a little uh, bit of an interesting thing about it. So when we disengage the force from the being. Uh, very often, you know, human mind does it. Why? Because uh, uh, deep within, we don't uh, want to surrender. You see, force is impersonal. But being is personal. So when there is a being, you surrender to the being. Force is like I just open to the force. Shobindu was very careful and to note this, uh, remind us that your surrender has not to be to the force, but to the Divine Mother. Why? Because when we surrender to the force, there is the force, divine force, which is impersonal. Then its action can be devastating. It's like saying that, well, I know the way electricity operates in these clouds and therefore I can make my own switches. Well, one can do it, but more often than not, we'll end up blowing up the house. But when you ask for the one who knows the entire technology, she builds your house, she knows the entire process. Not that one cannot discover, but probably one will blow up the body hundred times before one can discover. So the divine as being, we connect to her as, yes, the divine Shakti and the divine force and the divine being. So that's how the Indian uh, thought has described him as Satchidananda. He is not just consciousness, he is also being existence, the one true existence and he is Ananda. So uh, both are one the divine being and the divine consciousness. In Shurabindu's yoga, we look upon the divine not just as a force, but as conscious force which is a being with whom we can connect. Because if there is no being, we can, there is no role of bhakti. 
Because bhakti implies that there is a being, somebody who can connect with us, relate with us. Now, if we take him, take her only as a conscious force, then the path changes. And the joy of bhakti and the heart will never be nourished because the heart wants to connect with the divine. And Shubhindu says, not only it can connect, it is the crown of yoga. So, this is where we have to be careful. This is true that she is the divine force. But not just the divine force. She is also divine consciousness, divine ananda, divine wisdom, divine truth, divine existence and the divine being, all of it together. And she can express herself through a law of vibration starting from the original star, Nada. But all these are ways and aspects of herself. But she remains herself an infinite. So this is where it ends. So she is infinity putting on a human shape. And this mystery of taking a human shape is important. Because it makes it very easy. Shubhindu does speak about the avatar. And speaks about the embodiment. It makes it so much easy. Not that one cannot do it like that. One can try. But Shubhindu said, most likely you will land up in a hard cropper. Because you know, one is entering a field about which one has no idea. Uh, trying to call the supramental force, one may end up calling all kinds of forces because we have no clue about, uh, you know, the play of forces in this world. There are people who apparently believe that it's the Kundalini which has awakened. But Mother says 99% of the time, it is nothing but the vital energy which goes up and down the spine. And they think it is a Kundalini. She says if in one person it, it awakens by sheer, because in traditional yoga, Kundalini is awakened by the power of will and the Bij mantras, which is a forced way of opening it. So if it opens up and awakens, the onrush of that energy will devastate the system. So in most people it is that vital energy flowing up and down the column, Saraswati, Ganga, Jamna and one feels very nice, gives a very lot of energy, good feeling, but that's not Kundalini. In Shurabindu's yoga, the entire descent of the divine Shakti is from above to the base. Because it's a conscious process, you can handle it. And uh, therefore, to connect with her as the divine Shakti, but as the embodied divine Shakti. What she has worked out, she can pass it on to us just by opening to her as the divine being, as the form. And Shurabindu even used the word, beware of a hostile asurik maya, which creates the distinction. So people were asking that, yes, you have spoken about Divine Mother. In synthesis, you will see Divine Shakti. But later on, he said, open to the Mother. So he said, um, it's the same thing. He said, no, beware of that Maya which draws the distinction. I mean, uh, why not directly to the Divine Shakti? He said, beware of that Maya. You have to open to the Mother, not to the force, not even to the supramental force. Because obviously he knew what will happen as a result. So this is for the yoga. But... Theoretically, yes, she is all that we can conceive of, mankind is conceived of. Even this material nature is she. So she was asked that, you know, what is the difference between this nature and that? She said, yes, she is this also, but this is the nature in ignorance. This has to be rejected. Then only the higher supernature can come. So we can call her as supernature, Lyle Watson's book. <laughs> she is the supernature. Where you look behind plants and their operations, you see that supernature, consciousness and force operating. But that will not help us to transform us because that nature has fixed itself within limits through this inferior nature. So while we can appreciate that yes, there is consciousness, force and intelligence behind creation, but that we cannot uh, draw within us, that's why there is yoga. Automatically it won't happen. She operates through the veil of the yoga maya. In the book, The Mother, chapter 2, Shabindu says, The divine is in everything and everywhere, but he is hidden by the veil of the yoga maya. It is his maya, because we are not ready for that complete. So, turn to her as the mother, as the embodiment, to be more specific, one whose name was Mira Alfonso. <laughs> this. <laughs> well, she is the avatar for this work. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Namaste. If, if I understand... What we are talking about is to uh, embody the Satchitananda in yes. Mirror Fasa, because if yes. we are doing it in this concrete way, we can yeah. be uh, linked with the source. Yes. One small little thing with that. Yes, the embodiment of Satchitananda. 
except that even Krishna is an embodiment of Sachidananda. In a certain sense, we are all embodiments of Sachidananda. But the difference is that an avatar is given a specific work. So when we turn to Krishna, who is also Sachidananda Ganagan Sham, that's how he is called as, or Rama as Sachidananda Sarup. So uh, the embodiment will take us to the point where the embodiment is meant to lead us. So Sri Krishna will take us to the point where he is meant to lead us. Uh, probably if we are meant to go beyond, he will hand us over to Shuravita. <laughs> <laughs> Thus far and no further. So that's where the mystery of the form lies. And when we turn to her as an embodiment of Sachidananda, but as one who has the mandate to lead creation from the mental to the supramental state, then it will be perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.